Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today we have two guests from Virtual uh, Foundry, Foundry uh, Tricia and, and Brad, who are going to talk to us about their uh, FDM technology for metals, which uh, two of your teams are going to work on uh, during this course. Uh, they, they presented last year, thankfully, uh, to our class, and it was, I think, one of the highlights of the class and the course. Everybody really enjoyed the conversation and the presentation, and I'm sure you guys are going to uh, find it very useful and uh, they will be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. So without any further delay, uh, Trisha and Bradley, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Diab. Um, I, my name is Trisha Cease. Next to me on my screen is Bradley Woods. I don't know where he is for everybody else. Um, I'm the president of the Virtual Foundry. Brad is the founder and the inventor of um, all of the products that we sell in, and the full technology and process that they use to 3D print um, filament, metal, glass, and ceramic filaments on a regular FFF FDM 3D printer, debind, and center in common kiln equipment to achieve pure metal parts. So the presentation that we have today is going to talk about different methods for 3D printing um, metals. So we'll talk about the different technologies that are out there. Um, and then we will talk about where the uh, virtual foundries technology fits in, um, the differences, the results, and some of the possibilities, some of the cool projects that we've seen come across our desk here that we've been a part of. And we'll definitely have time for Q&A. So um, the chat will be up. Feel free to um, ask a question while we're presenting and we'll um, answer that as we go along. I think I have everything configured here, so I'll be able to see that and address those. Um, so this slide uh, just covers the agenda, which we just talked through. Um, so again, uh, Brad is the founder and the inventor of everything that we're doing here. Um, I'm the president, so Brad does everything um, science. I do everything business. Uh, it works out really well that way. And then uh, the virtual foundry was founded in Stoughton, Wisconsin, which is where we still are. Um, Brad started working on the technology in 2014. The company came into existence according to the government in 2015. And then the process was patented in late 2019, that patent was officially issued. So 2014, I was still in my basement, and during that and and uh, and during that time, I started a Kickstarter project. That was kind of how we financed how I financed my way out of the basement into a real building. And uh, Trisha joined, I think, a year and a half or two years later, and kind of took it from a science project into a business. So we're talking about other or different ways of 3D printing metal that exists today. Most of them go through, the, at least the most common ones, go through a three-step process. You're going to print, you're going to debind, and then sinter. So in the printing side of things, um, it's always using a layering technique, the additive manufacturing rather than subtractive, which starts with a chunk and removes. In additive, we're adding layers um, and we're using metal in some form. It's often powder, but sometimes it's in, a, in the shape of a rod um, or a filament. In the case of the rods and the filament, they have generally the same makeup. It's a metal powder with some sort of binder associated with it. And in other cases that we'll go through here, it's just loose powder. When a binder is used, the part that you make has to go through a debind process. And then everything ends up being centered. There are some metal 3D printing technologies that are working with metal directly. Um, they're using actual metal wire and melting it as they go. We're not gonna be talking through those um, really today. We're more discussing today powder and um, bound metal technologies. So 
So first talking about the, um, <clears throat> the biggest, most expensive machinery in metal additive manufacturing is using powder bed and laser. So this is a very specialized machine. It's, it works with a bin of metal powder, and then it's gonna use lasers to fuse those metal particles together. So the machine will, it has a, a surface and the machine will apply a very thin layer of metal powder to that surface. And then a laser will hit it and center in place those metal particles together. The machine will lay another layer of metal powder laser center that layer, again, um, applying a layer, centering layer, applying layer, centering layer as it's building this object from the bottom up. In this case, there is no binder. We didn't start with any binder with the metal powder and we didn't apply any binder through the building process. So in this case, there's no binder, there's no debind step required. And you're also centering in place. The centering, those fusing those metal particles together, that's happening during the printing process. But the print does need to go through a heat treatment process at the end to just sort of um, get the part to be homogenous and all together. Well, the next technology we're gonna talk about is binder jet. And this is very similar, except instead of lasers, it's going to use a glue. So it'll apply a thin layer of metal powder, and then it's gonna spray glue in all the spots that it needs to spray it. Another layer of powder, glue, powder, glue, like that. So it's building the object up. As it's building the object, that um, glue is acting as a binder holding those metal particles together. Now, because we, this technology does use a binder, you've gotta get that glue, you've got to get that binder out of there and then center those metal particles together so that you can have only metal at the end. And Brad, can you talk through the debind process in the binder jet situation? Right. They actually do two different steps. So essentially the glue is laid down just like an inkjet printer. It's really no different. It's the same technology. Lay down a layer of powder, squirt some glue on it, lay down another layer of powder. Um, but the glue doesn't set immediately. So they'll print into a cubicle that, that they completely fill and seal. And then with what is a solid block of powder at that point, they'll put it in an oven and it sits there for two or three days. Yeah. The glue's dry. <clears throat> and then as a secondary step, they call it depowdering. So they'll carefully remove the part from the loose powder. So the parts that were glued together stay as a solid object. The unglued powder falls away. And this is a, and it, it's a delicate, um, at, at that point, the part is very, very fragile and green, and they tend to have a lot of losses during this process. Though all the processes are, are getting better as they go along. Do you want me to go through to centering, Tricia? Sure, yeah, please do. Sure, so then after, after the depowdering phase, they'll put it in a, uh, in a very large centering oven. And depending on what the material, each metal um, you know, has different metallurgical requirements. So active materials such as um, uh, magnesium, aluminum, uh, things like that are a little bit more difficult. They'll have a shield gas atmosphere inside of it so that no oxygen can be present. Uh, some materials are centered in a, in, a, in, a, in a vacuum, nothing else. Some are actually centered in pure hydrogen, which is really interesting uh, because the idea is that if any oxygen is present, it's going to be devolved by the hydrogen. So it just burns it off. So there's all kinds of different things going on here. And this isn't specific to binder jet, this is centering in general, but essentially that's it. They'll put it in an oven and a typical center for maybe a 12 inch by 12 inch build volume is about two days. Okay, moving on to the next technology on our list is electron beam melting. And here you're also using a very specialized machine, single purpose machine. You're gonna use metal powder or wire 
And instead of a laser, you're using a, an electron beam in this case. You're gonna, you need to use, a, it needs to be done in a vacuum um, for the reasons that Brad had just mentioned about oxygen um, being trouble for the process. And in this case, rather than the uh, metal being sintered together, it's actually being melted together. Mm -hmm. um, there's no binder used in this process, so no debind is required, and there's no sintering, as I just said, because the metal is melted into shape during the printing process. This is going to produce a very rough shape. So uh, with this process, it's difficult to get um, a smooth finish, which is fine for um, many applications. It's also incredibly expensive. Yes. Okay, and then we're getting a little closer to the virtual foundries world and we're talking about material extrusion, um, FFF fused filament fabrication and FDM fused deposition modeling. So those are the, the two um, abbreviations for the most common type of 3D printing. So if you grew up with a 3D printer at school, or you've seen 3D printers around, it's most likely the FDM FFF type. Now here we're talking about closed systems. And by closed systems, I mean, these companies put out a printer, a debind station and a sintering um, kiln or furnace, and it's sold as a unit. You have to use their, um, machine, their hardware, their machinery and their um, materials as well. So all of the consumables, everything that you're using for this process, you're getting from the same company but it's going through that same three-step process. You're gonna print, debind, and center. And here um, we can see, <coughs> excuse me, the desktop metal studio system on the left, the Mark Forged Metal X system on the right. The Metal X is going to use filament line, just like regular, it's in the same shape. It looks like regular 3D printing filament. It will be filament line on a spool. Desktop metal worked it a little bit differently. It's the same type of material with metal, metal powder in a binder, but they put it in the shape of rods. It's like a, it's like a size and shape of a pretzel rod. Um, and that's, it, it's pretty challenging to get this metal powder with this binder in that filament shape so that it will wind around a spool. So desktop metal skipped the filament line altogether and they put their material into rods. But we're all talking about the same basic printing process, which right. is extrusion through a nozzle, building that shape. And the, the key downside to these systems, on top of, of being very expensive, by the time you get it home and set up, you know, it's over $200,000, which in the metal spectrum is pretty affordable but it's still a lot of money. But one of the key downside is, is there isn't much room for experimenting with them. They don't want you to take foreign materials and run it through this equipment. They want you to use things in exactly the way that they've described so that you're most likely to succeed. So it, it isn't very practical in a, in a laboratory environment. Right, so their software is gonna guide you through part shapes. And if it doesn't like the part shape, that you're trying to print, it will let you know and um, guide you, I believe it will guide you to an alternative shape that will be more appropriate for the process. And so once you've got your printed part, that's your green part, that still is made up of that same ratio of metal powder and whatever binder they're using. Now in both these cases in these closed systems, you need to um, go through a chemical wash in order to debind. So if you look at the studio system on the left, you can see this little guy in the middle here, that's their debinding machine. And that's going to have some um, a chemical application that will get that binder out of there. It's, uh, yeah, it's an industrial solvent. And then once that process is complete, you'll move your part into the sintering kiln or furnace press go, and it will run the parameters that the machine comes pre-programmed with. So not a lot of room for uh, messing with the process as you go, which is really nice for some people. Other people really like to have more control. Then we get into um, getting even a little bit closer to the virtual foundry. Now we're talking about BASF, which is a global company. They've created this 
brand of 3D printing filament called Ultrafuse. And Ultrafuse comes in stainless steel 316L and 17.4 pH. It's got those two um, varieties. That is going to print in nearly any FDM 3D printer. And there is a list of a few there. BASF has partnered with a few or with a couple of different um, 3D printer manufacturers. So they talk about this printer being the best for their filament and so forth, but it can print in a variety of 3D printers. They recommend having a closed and heated chamber. Um, they also give guidelines for nozzle temperature, um, print bed temperature, all those different things. Um, this is also going through that three-step process. It's metal powder with a binder. Um, that debind um, process uses vaporized nitric, uh, nitric acid. Um, so most people don't have that hanging around, nor the machinery to contain it. So when you get your printed part using the ultrafuse material, you need to send that away to a, a certified service bureau for that debinding and sintering process. And the sintering process uses a pure hydrogen environment. So we do get into some specialized processes here. So you can buy the filament printed on your own 3D printer, but then you'll need to send your part away for that post-processing. Um, with this material, they, the way, um, because of the way that the debine and the sintering process happen, they, rec they have some design guidelines that include 100% infill, consistent wall thickness. Um, if you need to use support material, it's going to be more of the um, same material that you're printing with. Um, and then you can either break off the supports before or after sintering. Uh, but it gets tricky because during the debind and sinter process, there is nothing else holding up the part. It is um, just in space inside the kiln. So if if there's an overhang or an outcropping, there's the potential for that to droop unless it has some support during that process. So Ultrafuse gives all these um, design guidelines. So with the, with the full process in mind to help you get success with your parts. Then moving on to the virtual foundry. So what we have is very similar to what we just talked about on the front end, but it has key differences on the back end. Again, going through the same basic print debind center process. The virtual foundry materials, again, are metal powder encased in a PLA compliant binder. Um, now where the other processes have a limited number of metals available, the virtual foundry offers um, pretty much an unlimited number. So we have 13 different centerable materials that we keep in stock all the time. And that includes a glass, a Pyrex material, as well as a few ceramics. And because we make all of these, these materials in the same way, that means we can plug nearly any solid into this process so that we can get other kinds of uh, materials into this 3D printable format. And we'll talk more about that later in the lecture. So this brand name is Filament, and Filament is going to print in any 3 FDM, FFF style 3D printer that accepts third-party materials. There are some things that make it work better, like a direct drive extruder versus Bowden tube and things like that, but it really is going to work in any 3D printer. Now, where we get really different from what we've already talked about is in the debinding process because of the binder that's used in this material, it's going to debind with only heat. There's no chemical, there's no separate equipment. You're going to debind in the same kiln that you use to center it. So once you've got your 3D printed part, it's that same ratio of metal powder to this plastic binder. You're going to debind it in it, or you'll bury the part in a refractory ballast within a crucible, and that's what's providing the part shape support during the process. You're gonna cover that crucible then with sintering carbon, and the 
And that material's job is to absorb oxygen because as we've discussed, oxygen is very damaging to the sintering process. Um, so we need to make sure that oxygen cannot get to the part. So we use sintering carbon for that. So because of that, uh, using that sintering carbon, that means that most materials can be debound and sintered in a regular piece of kiln equipment, a pottery kiln, for example, if it can uh, reach the temperatures needed. Um, then because the part is going to be buried in this like powdered support material, there are fewer design limitations in the part up front. So outcroppings are fine. Um, if you are printing something that requires supports, you will print those supports. You can use any support material that you normally would, including regular PLA or PVA, which is a water dissolvable support, including just more filament if you only have a single extrusion um, 3D printer. And then you're gonna break that support material away and that refractory ballast provides that part shape. So um, any shape is possible, including um, what is overhangs? What is that top of the bench? Is that what you call that? A bridging, I guess. Bridging, I yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so including bridging, because you can fill in that space with that refractory ballast and that, that bridge essentially will still be supported. And we need to support these shapes because as the binder leaves and the metal particles begin to join together, the part shrinks in on itself because they're, the metal particles are coming together and taking up less space. The part is going to shrink. So we need to make sure that the part is supported or pieces that are sticking out are going to droop as it goes through that process. So let's look at kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. At the top, you'll see the different processes that we talked about. And down the left, um, a list of, I guess, properties of those. So in the case of, um, does the process you're considering require proprietary equipment? Most of the time, yes, until we get to the BASF and the virtual foundries filaments. Does the process require proprietary consumables? In the powder bed situation, no, metal powder is an active and growing market. So there are lots of suppliers all over the world for metal powders. In the binder jet situation, yes, you're gonna to need to use their special glue. And then as we continue on to the closed systems, the BASF, the virtual foundry, um, yes, we are in the business of selling these materials. So. Um, certainly using those proprietary consumables in that case. Is there a debind process required? And if so, what does it involve? And then what's the general price of the system? So the laser powder bed machines, ah, this price should probably updated, be updated to closer to a million dollars. Powder bed binder jet is I'm sure well over half a million now. The EBM machines, I don't have as much familiarity with that process. Um, do you have an idea about those, Brad? Yeah. No, I haven't actually seen one on the market yet. I know people yeah. use them, but. We are more familiar with the other processes that use a, a metal powder. And the FFF closed system, as Brad mentioned earlier, is closer to $200,000 once you've got it home and installed and you've been trained. Um, the BASF filament, again, is using a printer off the shelf, but you're going to have to debind and center with certified vendors. Now, they do make that um, very cost effective in the beginning. So you can buy, um, if you're buying from a certain store, uh, Matter Hackers, for example, your first kilograms worth of parts can be centered at once for free you can buy additional processing tickets that will process up to one kilogram of parts. And they recommend these parts fit within a 100 um, millimeter cubed volume for $50. So they make the, the, the process pretty affordable. 
um, but you're only going to get one run out of that. And um, you have to send a card away. You're going to, they, they do the processing two times a month. So you'll have to wait, depending on when they receive your part, you could wait a couple of weeks back for that. Um, one of their, the vendors that they use is DSH Technologies. They're located in New Jersey. And if you've contacted DSH Technologies directly to ask them to run a sintering cycle for you, it's $1,500. So BASF is uh, really helping offset the cost of that post-processing for the customers who buy that material. Now, then the virtual foundry, we have that $20,000 there, but we sell uh, a 3D printer, we sell a sintering kiln. If you went with all the equipment that we offer, you can be all in on a full metal 3D printing system for $6,000. So you can see that there's a huge range um, of prices among the different technologies. Now, when you're talking about, well, how many parts do you wanna make? who, what, te what technology is right for what place. The, the laser powder bed and the binder jet, those powder bed systems are the machines that are gonna be able to produce the most parts at once. Because not only can they do many in a row, they can also do several rows at once, depending on how deep their bin of powder is because the bin will just, that bed will just continue to lower and they'll continue to add more powder. So as big as their bin is, they can do, and as small as your part is, they can do hundreds of parts in one pass. So those systems are gonna be the closest to production that metal additive manufacturing offers today. As we move to the right in the technologies, we're getting, excuse me, we're getting a little slower and slower. So the um the production that or the production volume that we're seeing on the the right end of the slide here especially with with the basf and the virtual foundry is going to be how many printers do you have running how many kilns do you have access to um what is your printer build volume and things like that so we're getting more into one-off situations as we move from the left to the right So we've um, so talking about some of the benefits of FFF or FTM metal. Definitely a decreased lead time, much lower hardware costs as we just saw, and energy savings over a machine that runs a laser. Um, rapid prototyping, freedom from third-party suppliers. There's a very low barrier to entry as we saw six thousand dollars compared to a million dollars. And this is a much safer solution. So dealing with metal powder as an open um, container is very uh, hazardous. So you need hazmat equipment. It's, it's a very special process if you wanna change materials or if you want to add more material, um, you have to be very careful about that. It comes with lots of hazards uh, working with metal powder. So looking at FFF, FDM, 3D printing over the metal AM processes. Now, the first thing that we have on here is not reliant on gravity. And what that's about is things like space and ships. So a metal, a powder bed machine is not gonna be very helpful on a ship that's go going with the waves, that powder's moving around in there. Um, a, a FDM 3D printer, however, will, would be able to handle that just fine. The system is very mobile. So you can install a 3D printer and a kiln in, a, um, in the field, right? Um, as long as you have the power and you can make metal parts wherever you are. There's lots of hardware flexibility. So with the virtual foundries process, you're using new, any 3D printer, you're using any kiln that can handle the temperatures. So um, lots of flexibility there. There's gonna be generally lower energy consumption. There are no toxic chemicals involved. Um, it's fully hands-on. So that means you have control over every part of the process. You can tweak your design however you want. You can 
um, try centering for a little bit longer? Or what if I moved through these um, temperature changes more quickly, what would happen? So it really allows for a lot more study of the process, adjusting variables to see the different results. And if my part comes out and I wish it were a little bit more this way, I can go back to the print. I can go back to the computer model and make some adjustments at that level that can affect the outcome at the very end. Um, much lower cost equipment as we've seen and unlimited material options, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So um, for instance, we do offer custom materials. So we've made things like molybdenum, which I always like to tell, say to people because it took me a long time to be able to say molybdenum in the first place. Um, so I like talking about that one in particular. And a very fun one is basalt, which is a moon dust simulant. So there's a company out there aiming to be able to build structures on the moon using in situ materials and the virtual foundry's general uh, filament 3D printing process. So they sent us a moon dust simulant, which is basalt, basalt, and we converted that into 3D printing filament for them and sent them back, set that back for testing. Um, so then the, the column on the right talks about in research and it really, um, we're talking about the wide variety of materials and the unlimited variables, um, which are, have all um, just been talked about. So what are the results? Uh, the results include microscopic porosities. So because we're fusing these metal particles together rather than melting them together, there is still a little bit of space in there. But you have control over how much. So you can shrink the part more to make it more dense. And then you're also subject to greater potential for shape change. You can shrink it less and make it be less dense and there's less potential for the shape to change as it shrinks in on itself. Um, the strength, which I'm gonna skip over to the right here, the strength is gonna be less than solid metal because of that, because it's got that porosity in it. It's not 100% dense, it's not ingot. So um, the strength properties are gonna be different from um, solid metal. And the, um, Brad, why don't you talk about the thermal and electrical conductivity? Right. <clears throat> so the copper material will have thermal and electrical conductivity that's proportionate to its density. So if we print, uh, say, a copper shunt of some type, it will, that is 80% dense, it'll have 80% of the thermal or electrical conductivity. Pretty, pretty close anyway. We've had a couple of different universities dig pretty, you know, into this pretty far experimentally to, to put some numbers on it. And the, uh, the paper listed there uh, lays it all out. It's pretty interesting. So Brad is always working on um, different techniques to raise that density. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. In many cases in industry, higher density is um, preferred. There are some instances where lower density is preferred and there are some where it doesn't matter at all. But in general, we try to steer people away from applications where the part is going to be under heavy stress or load. Uh, when people first were learning about metal additive manufacturing <clears throat> to make engine parts with it or a trailer hitch, and that's just not an appropriate use. Today, it'll get there someday, but it's not there yet. And this is something that we experience regularly where people will just have an unrealistic expectation of the application. So a lot of what Trisha and I have been working on is educating people on design for additive manufacturing. It's very beneficial to just think about it differently. So if you think about all the car parts in a car, they were made to solve whatever problem it is or whatever job they do but it was also made to be mass produced. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to additively manufacture a part 
using the same techniques that you would use for a mass in a mass production environment. And there's some really cool, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned this further on, Tricia, but um, uh, <laughs> conformative, what am I looking for, Tricia? What's the word? Generative design? Generative design is really interesting and lends itself really well to additive manufacturing. Um, go take a look at it. You'll start to see it popping up here and there, but it's essentially a method of mathematically growing organic shapes. And they kind of tend to come out looking like this. Not sure if you can see that or not, but this is, this is just a, a 90 degree brace. But you can see it was generated using um, artificial intelligence. So it was grown more like a tree would grow its branches. So it reacts to stresses that you put into the formula and that kind of thing. So just generally thinking about design for additive manufacturing is sort of a next step in the, uh, in the progress of the technology. Right. So the design of a lot of parts, things that you look around and you see, they were designed to suit the manufacturing process for how they're made. So we see lots of solid chunk parts because machining is involved in a lot of part manufacturing. Or um, we'll see more solid parts because they've been um, injection molded. And <clears throat> you can't really put an internal channel in an injection molded part. You can't really have um, that part that Brad showed. You can't have um, the thin walls and like a, a grid in an injection molded part, nor a machined part. So we don't see parts like that now. But what added a manufacturing allows is a whole new way of making parts. So, um, if you're, if you're looking at a part and wondering, could I just 3D print this? Go further, ask more questions. And if I am going to 3D print this, how can I change the shape to suit the new manufacturing process? So the process that the virtual foundry offers does really well with these um, gener with generative design shapes. They also call it topological optimization which is also very fun to say. And it includes thinner walls. So this process is going to put material only where it's needed. It's gonna be at the fastening um, area. We need to put a bolt through here, um, or there's gonna be some extra stress at this corner. We're gonna add material here, uh, but the rest is space. And so there's only material where it's needed. And that means the shapes look very different, but we are going to start seeing very different shapes as we go forward into the future here and additive manufacturing becomes more prolific. And there's a really, there's an interesting economy to building your shapes like this. So you would never build this, normally you wouldn't machine this in titanium, it would be prohibitively expensive. But as printed here, this is only about 25 grams of titanium which is cost effective. So the generative design concept is very exciting um, for me personally. I think it's going to be really cool to see some of these shapes emerge. Um, and you can begin to see that as 3D printing artists um, come online and they're making furniture, they're making art, they're making lamps that have this more generative design. So um, we'll, we'll start to see that in more... Um, I guess I'll say industrial applications as well. You can go online and um, very easily find photos of generatively designed motorcycles, for example. Um, and those are really cool looking. So let's talk about some interesting projects. I mean, we already have them, but we have some more. So um, possibilities with this style of, of making parts. So first of all, you can make parts with materials that you couldn't before and glass is one of them. So lots of people work with glass in many different ways. I think most of the time we think of glass as art or, um, you know, kitchen things. We've got glass bowls and things like that. Um, but Brad, tell us where art, I'm sorry, glass is used in um, industry and science. Right. 
So we're getting some crossover in places and it kind of tends to blend between the glasses and the ceramics. And actually I noticed your third bullet point there is, is metalloids. And there are places where ceramics and metals and glasses start to blend together. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, and a simple example I would say is um, gas lenses used for shield gases in TIG welding. Um, these are, I'm not sure how to describe them, but they're, they're very high tech and they focus the flow of gases through a nozzle. So they'll have a focal point that's maybe out in front or wherever the, the plasma is being generated in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an arc welding process. So people are 3D printing ceramic uh, gas lenses. Um, we have people working with sort of interim materials. So um, one that we just put out is silicon carbide. It may not be the best example. Although I, I, as a transitional material, actually maybe it's a little bit easier to think of tungsten where people are um, printing or creating a part with tungsten and then uh, carburizing it and winding up with a tungsten carbide part. And there's blends between there where a, so maybe um, tungsten particles are welded together with a third party material to make uh, machine tooling tips, things like that. Very, very high strength things that you couldn't possibly machine, but you can sinter them. And this is pretty common with, um, in manufacturing and indexable tools on CNC machines and things like that. This has been common for 20 years, but now we're coming up way, with ways of editing, editively manufacturing those same high-tech materials. So uh, we're, we're just at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, metal additive manufacturing is very young. Um, so it's, totally unknown, um, everything that we can do with it. And it's gonna be a process of discovery over the next many years. So two years from now, people will do, be doing things with this stuff that we couldn't even conceptualize today. Uh, the end of the list here is a more um, industrial oriented um, uses. This is what people think of more. Um, they think about manufacturing, they think about um, industrial uses when they learn about metal 3D printing, short run manufacturing, prototyping, injection molding. Printing magnets is something that's come up regularly um, around the virtual foundry here. So once in a while, someone will ask for a special filament because they're headed towards how can we 3D print a magnet? Um, in this general area, we've done a few where, I mean, it's pretty mm -hmm. obvious to print, for example, an, an iron core for an electromagnet or something like that. But we actually have people talking about directly printing neodymium and then um, magnetizing it as a post-process. So you would have a very efficient uh, neodymium or rare earth applications where you don't need to use so much material. You can minimize the amount that's consumed in an electric motor application, for example. Um, looking at some other cool projects that have come through. Uh, Brad, tell us about this Ice Cube Neutrino Istro. Okay, I tend to think that everyone knows what this is, but I know that not everyone does now. Um, but at the South Pole, there is, in the Antarctic, they did, an, it's a neutrino observatory. They call it the Ice Cube. It's a mile cube of these neutrino sensors. So they're looking for, you know, interstellar subatomic particles. Well, they did kind of like the, uh, the little brother version of that one next to it. So this was a basically a drill tip. This went on a six foot long heat exchanger. And the reason that 3D printing worked well for the project is it has complex internal cooling channels. So essentially they would just run hot water down through this thing. The hot water would cool and then take the energy away from the tip. So this is literally the bit for a large scale ice drill. Um, so we talked about molybdenum as a custom material. Um, we did a, a custom material for NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, that was very exciting. Um, a couple of other custom things that we've done is a magnesium. 
Uh, we did a we did an iron um, filament for University of Guelph, and um, a couple different versions of titanium. One for a company that's working on um, implantable titanium uh, medical devices. Um, another university that's working on um, nuclear energy. So different things like that. That's the custom projects are always especially interesting. First of all, because we're working with a different kind of material, but also because it's just uh, really fun to learn about what people are up to, uh, the new things that they're thinking about doing, and the pro the old problems that they're thinking about solving it in new ways. A couple more um, examples of projects: the moon dust simulant we talked about earlier, um, heat exchangers. So this image in the middle is a 700 gram copper fluid heat exchanger. Um, the piece the, in the photo shown here is not centered. So this is what a green copper print looks like right off of the printer. Um, but the fellow who is working with this shape has been able to su successfully center parts this large. Um, so that's been fun and exciting. So what he has to do is make the temperature changes in the debind and centering process very slow. So that helps that binder uh, sublimate out of the part correctly and prevents cracking as the part changes temperature itself. If it moves to, if the part is large like this and the temperature changes too quickly, it will crack. So the key for something like this is very slow temperature changes. Ch temperature changes. This is a very challenging part to center just because it's so large. And most people, when they come into something like that, will try to warm, warn them off of it, or at least make sure that they understand that this, that they're, they're pioneering something new. And this company was all about it, and they developed a new process that works very well. Um, the image on the left you see is a, um, a case where somebody had a cabinet with a bronze um, cabinet pole. And one of them was missing and they wanted to recreate one. So they used the Virtual Foundries bronze filament. Um, well, they, they enlisted a company to help them, first of all, get the computer model. So do, using scanning to get the computer model, printed it in bronze, went through the divine and centering process, and then they applied some aging techniques to make it look old so that it would match its um, original counterpart. Now the image on the right is a copper uh, trophy. That one has been was printed and that has gone through the debine and centering process. And this was one of the first projects that I was involved in when I started. Brad had committed to making 27 of these guys. And um, I didn't realize it when I first started, but now that we're a few years in, this is a ridiculous shape to have to make 27 of these. So um, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a cool shape for 3D printing to be sure. Going through the debind and centering process was uh, a bit of a challenge, but he got it done. Um, I might have bit off a little bit more than I should have, <laughs> but I got through it. <laughs> and then um, the last slide of in interesting projects I have here is uh, involves the, the um, tungsten 3D printing filament. So the tungsten is very interesting. It's our highest loaded material at 94%, and that's by mass. Um, it's dense. It's the heaviest 3D printing material on the market. And it's surprisingly one of the easiest to print as well. So this material, and it's the one on the left, the, the image in the middle that um, engine is not tungsten. We'll talk about that piece in a second, but the one on the left is printed out of tungsten. What's really cool about this material is that in its green state with the plastic still in it, it provides a radiation shielding benefit nearly equal to lead. It is equal to lead up to certain uh, radiation amounts. And then after that, it starts to change. So what this means it's an, is that it's a 3D printable, non-toxic lead replacement in radiation shielding applications. Um, so that material is extra cool. So this 
engine block in the middle was um, created using a liquid phase sintering techniques. Brad, walk us through that. Right. So this was initially printed with um, stainless steel 316L. And I did this part <clears throat> at a time where sometimes we would show people parts and they wouldn't believe that they were 3D printed. So I started leaving the 3D print lines in there so that it would be very obvious. So that's kind of the reason for the texture. But this, this uses a little bit different strategy. Um, it is 316L particles, but it's backfilled with bronze. So it's essentially um, brazed 316L, I guess you would say. And we were talking earlier how when you center a part, it, it shrinks. This part didn't shrink at all because all the space that was previously air or plastic in the binder were backfilled with bronze. And this is just an, a demonstration that I'm trying to get more people interested in. This is a really interesting technology and it, it deserves more exploration. So it's called liquid phase because the bronze is going to melt before the steel centers. So you put this bronze powder in contact with the steel part in the kiln. And as the, as the temperature raises, the, brown, the bronze will melt and it'll get sucked up into the steel part via capillary action. And like Brad said, just fill in all that space. Right. So when I made it, I put a sprue or sort of a stem out the bottom that stuck down about an inch. And I put a small container of bronze as the bronze melted and everything heated up, the stainless steel soaked up that metal like a sponge. And I really, I, I was impressed at how well it'll work. And I've done this later with parts where capillary action carried the bronze from the bottom of the part to the top, you know, as much as seven inches and it had no problem at the top. So I was, I was just very surprised at how much power there can be with the capillary action. We have a partner innovator who's named Mr. Highball. That's his uh, YouTube name. He works a lot with our materials and mainly copper and he'll use this liquid phase centric technique. Um, so in, in the photo here, we're seeing steel infiltrated with bronze what Mr. Highball is doing is copper infiltrated with zinc. So he's actually created this zinc paste. Um, and then he will surround the part, or if his part is hollow, he'll put the zinc paste inside it and um, center it that way. Uh, so one thing that's really cool, besides all the other things that we said about this liquid phase centering technique, is that it really doesn't add any cost. The only additional cost is that secondary material that you're adding. So now you're getting a fully dense part or even an, um, a hybrid part, and you didn't really add any cost of, uh, beyond the cost of the material. So that was really exciting too. And generally speaking, you know, uh, stainless infused with bronze may not be particularly practical. But this can be done with hundreds of other materials. So we're, we we want to see we want to motivate people to come up with new alloys. The other thing that can happen in here. So in this example, stainless steel is not miscible. Uh, it won't uh, break down in the bronze. Other materials are different. So you can actually get. So for example, the zinc and the copper. You wind up. You start out with two constituent metals, and you wind up with a new alloy at the end. And um, a group, a lab in, I think it was in Finland, just did a project using our materials for developing precisely mixed um, alloys. You know, so coming up with new alloys and sort of creating the alloy on the fly. It was, it's pretty interesting. That paper is also referenced on our website. Um, those are all the slides I have. So I'm gonna stop share. And we will um, open up the floor for questions. And we do have one already, Brad. Are these printed parts usable in real life or are they only tests? Um, you could use them. We have people, I'm trying to think of examples that have actual applications. So one example is, um, okay, a coal-fired nuclear power plant and they needed these parts there of a Venturi valve that goes inside of the cooling tower. The, the 
the power plant is 40 years old or whatever, and they can't get parts. So that's an example where they're actually using our bronze to create these valves and that worked well. So there are lots of applications and, and it kind of depends on, on how you look at it. I mean, it's a hard chunk of metal. Any place you can use a hard chunk of metal, it will work just fine. So most of what's happening with our materials is research. So universities, um, national labs, um, the research arms of the US military, um, places like that. So those are the people who are buying and working with it the most. Um, and we always, we like to ask what people are up to. First of all, it helps us provide a more complete solution when we know what results they're after. And um, in some of these situations, we can't know, like a, a national lab might be working on a, a contract that they can't share. And the military especially is fairly tight-lipped about what they're up to. Um, but in one case, they were, <clears throat> excuse me, one, one group was using the tungsten because they just needed something really or, um, you know, groups are looking at radiation shielding. Copper provides some benefit there as well. So um, the probably what's in use in industry the most right now is the tungsten with the uh, it for shielding applications. <clears throat> for mass production, does this method seem viable? And no, mass production, definitely not. This is gonna be more suitable for prototypes, iterations, one-offs, custom parts, um, things like that. If you wanna make more parts, you can certainly buy more printers. Um, it's called a print farm when you have many 3D printers running in conjunction. Um, the powder bed systems are gonna be close, as close to production as you can get, but 3D printing is not replacing injection molding. 3D printing is not replacing other methods of mass manufacturing yet. Is the benefits we get from the green parts immediately after printing, is it temporary? Right. So I'm gonna talk about uh, like the radiation. No, it is not temporary. So the, well, I guess I shouldn't say that with such confidence. I don't, I'm not super knowledgeable in radiation shielding, but my assumption is that the part could be used indefinitely. Do you yeah. agree? Yeah, I do. The, the binder that's holding it together is polylactic acid and it has a, a, a good lifespan. So in that case, uh, no, the part could be used long-term. <laughs> So thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Trisha and, uh, and Brad. And I'm sure the two teams that are working on this technology will, will have questions and maybe they will channel it through uh, Matthew as they, uh, you know, they just the lecture and, and have more questions about the, uh, the technology. But uh, really appreciate your, your help. You're always uh, ready to come and present to, to my classes and we really appreciate that. Very, very interesting presentation. Yeah, and we're, um, we're very accessible. Ask us questions and we'll do our best to help move this technology forward generally. I really appreciate that and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yep, uh, thank you. Thank you. So have a good day and uh, we'll definitely see you some other semester presenting again to one of the new classes. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, we'd be happy to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hey, um, I have to ask you what the temperature is there. Uh, that's a good question. I think it's minus 10 degrees, something like that. I'm not yeah. sure. It has been cold for the last few days. Yeah. Uh, it's just crazy. Minus 9 degrees and the wind chill is, uh, is minus 16. Is that Fahrenheit? The, no, centigrade. Celsius? So, uh, yeah. Celsius, oh, yeah. And we're at 6. So let me do that conversion. Oh, yeah. Oh, minus 14. So we have you beat by a couple yeah. of degrees. <laughs>